Miami, Florida, Tuesday, August 7th, 1984. At six o'clock, the sales office of real estate developer Jesus Portella was closing. Mr. Portella had emigrated from Cuba 22 years earlier, building a successful business in Miami. His 22-year-old son, Mario, was recently married and worked as a salesman for his father, as did Mario's uncle. A little after six, a couple approached the office. Mario and his uncle went out to talk with him. The couple asked about condo prices. The man seemed anxious as they spoke. The uncle explained that the office had closed. He asked them to return in the morning. At the couple's request, he went inside to get some brochures for them. He didn't see what was happening outside. An armed man had pulled up, and the three were abducting Mario. spotted temporary tags on the car, but only got the last three numbers. He told Jesus what he saw. Mario, forced into a blue and gray car, heading north on 122nd Avenue. Then he called the police. But Mario's father couldn't wait for the police to arrive. He went looking for his son. Soon he spotted a car matching the description of the kidnapper's vehicle. For years, he had carried a licensed gun for protection. Now, he was ready to use it. But it was the wrong car. Realizing he couldn't find the kidnappers himself, Jesus returned to wait for the authorities. The Metro Dade police responded to the kidnapping call. For Detective Alvaro Romero, abductions were not unusual in 1984. At that time, we were inundated with kidnappings. We had probably one kidnapping a month related to narcotics or drug-related kidnappings, where the victims would either be involved in drugs themselves or possibly fam family members were involved in, in drug dealings. But detectives quickly realized Mario's abduction was different. Questioning Mr. Portella and, and recognizing the fact that he was a prominent businessman in the community led us to believe that it was not narcotics related and strictly a financial gain for, for the people who kidnapped his son. It meant anybody who knew of Mr. Portella's wealth could be a suspect. Hoping the kidnappers left some trace behind, crime scene technicians dusted the door for fingerprints. Mario's uncle believed they might have touched it as they peered inside. No usable prints were found. Less than an hour after the kidnapping, the phone rang. Hello? Speaking in Spanish, the caller asked for Mario. Mr. Portella didn't recognize the voice. The caller then announced he was part of a terrorist group that was holding Mario for $3 million in ransom. 
Although no recording equipment was in place, a Spanish-speaking detective listening in identified the caller's accent as Colombian. The caller threatened to kill Mario if Jesus notified police and the FBI and warned that the group was watching the Portela house and gave the address. The distraught father pleaded to speak with his son. The kidnapper announced he would call Jesus's home in three days. Police could not trace the call, but it helped them understand the type of criminal they were facing. We felt the kidnappers were very violent. Uh, they took precautions as far as the phone calls that they were making, and uh, they were very serious in their threats. They knew what they were doing, and we took them very seriously.